We are here to talk about, um, you know, your first feature film, uh, Medusa Deluxe. And um, it's a murder mystery set in a hairdressing competition. When it comes to writing, how do you go about the murder mystery element? Did you know how and why before you started writing or did that come during the process? Yeah, no, I mean, I kind of, in my head, it was always a deconstructed murder mystery. I knew I was kind of trying to pull it apart and trying to show it in a different way and tell it in a different way. And so I went in with that in my head. And I guess the two things that were kind of there for me throughout was like, I, I'm passionately in love with hairdressing. Like I really admire and appreciated it and I want to put it on a pedestal. And then over here, I grew up with murder mysteries and I was kind of thinking like, you know how storytelling changes over time. Like what what is what is it today? Like how do you push at it and kind of, yeah spin a few plates so it feels like it's cracking at times and yeah, I mean, hairdressers are such an important part of our society I think and yeah yeah I mean I think people share more with their hairdressers sometimes than they do with their, their own partners or you know their doctors mm -hmm. or things of this big sense of trust so it always surprises me when there aren't more films or tv programs that, that feature these people why was it important to you to put them into the into the spotlight yeah it's you're completely right it's it's hard to because I could just totally agree I was there thinking like you've got this thing with hairdressing that something obviously like I love it and I want to kind of be there because I you know I'll come back to that side in a second but there's another part of it that like I mean I'm, I'm interested in comedy it's you know Medusa's a kind of comedic drama and how you can find a space where it's like you've got the high of kind of how you present yourself to the world and like what hairdressing means in culture and then you've got the kind of low of just the gossip and the fun of a salon and you can pinball between the two and that's comedy and that's what initially kind of grabbed me but I'd had this long kind of like interest and affinity because I my mum went to hairdresser so much as a kid she went once a week and it was such a kind of you know like almost like religious thing where I used to sit in the back and it's the first time I started to see kind of like women's magazines and started to see like Elle Vogue and look through them and I guess I started to develop an interest in fashion at that point and that kind of became an interest in art became an interest in film and then going back to that and looking at kind of like the creativity of hairdressing and how it's kind of I, yeah, as I was saying, like you want to put it on a pedestal, like I respect it. And I kind of just feel like it's as extravagant and kind of interesting and fun as you can possibly imagine. So you just want to put it center stage and run with it. Yeah. And the the most recent other example of a hairdresser in film that I can think of is um, Jill Six as the stylist. Um, mm. Jill herself is is a hairdresser. So I'm guessing that that helped her when she was writing. So for you how much you know research did you have to put into to learning all of that jargon uh, all of that jargon yeah it was a funny one because like when I was at art school I got told to quit and become a hairdresser so like <laughs> I was I, I guess I was like at that time I was starting to gravitate towards film and like I guess I was cutting people's hair at that point like but not I wasn't I'm not even going for a second pretend I was a professional hairdresser because I really wasn't and I had never been taught or trained but like I had, I, I was cutting my own hair, I was cutting other people's hair. It was something that was just in and around my life for some reason. I can't really explain why. And then it's only over time you start to look at, you know, you start to look at your life in a different way, don't you? You start to go back to thinking about those times that you spent with your mum driving across town to get to her hairdresser, thinking about him and how they inhabited that space. I started to relate it to my family who were like, they're a big Irish family. And it's kind of like, they'll all sit around the table. They'll all be telling long stories and they'll rack on turns because it's kind of like, it's just in the Irish culture. And I suddenly realised that that chimes with kind of ensemble cast. It chimes with people I love like Nashville, Robert Altman, and then, yeah, hairdressing. And it was suddenly, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's incremental. You start to put the pieces together and you get to a point where you're like, you bring, you bring your own passion and something you feel like you can push to the limits a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I definitely in terms of like the, the hairdressing lingo and that, I definitely feel like I learned a few names for things that I, I hadn't learned before. You know, there's all these really fancy, extravagant hairstyles. That must have been fun to get to to play around with which ones you were going to feature on screen. I mean, it's amazing. Like, I, I've been a weird guy just sitting in the back of salons for a couple of years, like kind of just getting like, you know, I come from like like development and research. Like I, I've worked in on other people's films before and... I don't know, like research is a massive part of it. So I've I've read 
basically every hairdressing book there's ever been virtually and from like ones from the 16th century right through till now like Mr Champagne was the big hairdresser of the Marie Antoinette era and then you come through to Jose Elba in LA in the 80s or late 70s 80s and like just how they talk about things you take a little bit from all of it like the the face shape specifically like the inverted diamond or the inverted heart like all of that comes from Jose Elba's book and then something about um there's the thing about the Russian weave came from a really specific hairdresser in Peckham who kindly allowed me to just sit in the background while her son played Fortnite and talked to me for a few hours and it was like she was basically like yeah you've got to understand that Russian weave that's what it's about that's the best weave and yeah you pick those little things up and you want it to be an honest portrait you want it to be something that's really inbuilt into the world and that every hairdresser will kind of like yeah just realize the love it's made with do you have any because there's, there's a, I think there's a lot of of great lines a lot of great quips and things in this film do you have any particular favorites yourself oh um it's it's weird actually because you write them and you go wow yeah I'm really happy and they come over time but you're in the character at that point like you are the character it's a weird thing mm. and then you hand it over to the actor and then you start to kind of you feel the emotion weirdly it's it's the emotional beats that stay with me more like when I was you know when we were filming the kitchen sequence and we we just had a really hard day that day and we filmed the film in nine days so it was a pretty pressurized shoot I mean it's obviously it's a low budget first feature of course it's going to be pressurized but like I remember we just hadn't got that shot and we absolutely had to get it. We were in real trouble if we didn't. And we got seven minutes in. So it's obviously, as you know, it's all long takes. So we got seven minutes or so into it. And I was aware that I just thought Heidi was doing the most incredible performance. I was just there just going, oh, my God, I was so happy. And then thinking we've got another 10 minutes of the shot to go. And if we if anything screws up, we've lost it. So, yeah, that's actually that's weirdly probably what stays with me more like I mean obviously the Pantene line like that's <laughs> that makes me smile every time but actually it's because of people always come out and quote it which is really nice yeah and visually the film it flows seamlessly from you know one scene to another one character to another and it's, you're playing with this one one take I know obviously it was broken down into chunks yeah um and but there's there's a dance and almost like ballet quality to the the way that the camera work weaves in and out of everything why did you decide to to shoot in this way because I guess there was a a much easier way where everybody was just kind of sat around having a chat yeah I guess I guess like it comes from I mean I guess I think of the camera as like a wand and I'm thinking of like uh, you know, I've got it. There's a few different experiences. I was I, I was thinking about how you can push storytelling, how you can tell stories in different and new ways. And like, I think that's if you're picking up a camera today, that's that's what you're sort of here for almost like. And I was aware that my nieces, my brothers are a lot older. So my nieces are kind of like, you know, they were growing up when I was babysitting them and stuff. And they were watching long hairdressing and makeup tutorials on YouTube with no cuts and just people walking around their rooms. And I was just becoming aware that that was like a normal way for them to, you know, take in media. Mm -hmm. And it started to make me think like, you know, when sound comes around, everyone thinks it's a fad. When colour comes around, everyone thinks it's a fad. Like every single development in cinema is always apparently a fad to start with. And I was just looking at long takes thinking, I don't think it is. I think there is a, there's a shift in culture. Like people, when they're playing computer games, when they're moving the camera around Mario or Zelda or whatever, like they're controlling the camera, they're inhabiting the space in a different way. And for the murder mystery, it's like, as soon as you stay with a character beyond like, let's say the red herring or the, you know, uh, the, the the dramatic beat or whatever it's you're changing the sense of what film it is it becomes a character-led drama rather than just it's uh just a murder mystery and it gets into the world of slacker nashville link later all these filmmakers that i just really admire and that's the world i'm interested in so it was kind of like it was a very natural confluence of events that kind of got me there and the long takes help push sort of almost like a theater uh, experience when you're watching because you know that these people have done this in such you know long chunks how difficult was it then to find actors who were prepared to do that because it's not necessarily something that film actors are used to doing yeah I mean Gary Davey I've got to like just thank him massively casting director on the film he's an incredible casting director and just got it from the very first second what we were trying to do and you're right yeah you do have to there is a level of precision and you're balancing the precision with the kind of obviously it's a heightened comedic drama but you're you that precision with realism is a real kind of it's a focus for the whole film and it's about kind of like getting people who are along for the ride like you know like it was I was thinking about it as a troupe we all shot in Preston we all went away together like 
how you can get people who are going to buy into that collegiate atmosphere where you're all singing from the same hymn sheet you're all kind of like whatever the expressions are like just you know you're you're, you're going towards the same goal because that's how I work and that's the way I'm actually like interested in working I want people to be on board for the ride all come away together all be kind of like pulling for each other like it's the same with the crew like I look across at Robbie and when we're getting a take that we're both really happy with we're both kind of smiling and enjoying it and there is yeah that collegiate atmosphere and it's it's really important to me and I think it's really important to the film and in terms of like references there's a play by Deviate called John which I actually saw weirdly in a cinema because it was like cheaper to see in a cinema than it was to go to the theatre to see it <laughs> and like I just remember sitting there thinking it was like almost better than any film I'd seen that year it was so astounding what it was doing it had a moving um, set that spun the entire way through and told this particular life story of John and it was just those moments where you're you're taking a bit from theatre, you're taking a bit from murder mysteries, a bit from Nashville, a bit from EastEnders, and you're trying to go somewhere new with it all. Yeah. And so this is your first time, you know, your first time feature. You've got, like I said, nine days to shoot it. You're doing all mm. of this, you know, intricate camera work. You've got long, heavy dialogue scenes. And then you throw in a, a dance number at the end. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's just about trying to, I want to send people out with a spring in their step. Like I want it to be something that's really pushing at boundaries of filmmaking at the same time as being engaging and kind of bringing an audience with it. And to me, it's like, you know, Haida, sorry, Haida Gak, um, the character Gak is played by Haida and he's the outsider almost in the film. Like um, obviously it's the ending, so I don't want to say too much, but like, you know, in the sense of like, it's about bringing him into the community. It's about a kind of a narrative beat told through dance that's giving you the, you know, the the firepower that a dance can do from like Bollywood to Claire Denny, like they're clear references, but like, how do you, how do you use that in storytelling? How, how do you kind of like feed in a way of kind of giving an emotional beat to that character through a dance? And that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. I, I, there's all the fun of it. And there's also the kind of storytelling side that I'm, like, yeah, I'm pretty passionate about. And the film is out very soon. So I guess my final question would be, why should people take a chance on, on this film? <laughs> I mean, it's going to be it's a fun chance, isn't it? What, what do you think? People will go out enjoying it, I think. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, definitely, you know. I mean, I, to be honest, you, you can't really say it as a director. Like, you just got to say thank you. Like, anyone who goes to see it, I'll just be so thankful. And obviously, yeah, it does send you out with a bit of a kind of spark, hopefully. Like, it is an engaging, it wants to It wants to kind of, like, work with an audience. It wants them to be there and enjoy it and, yeah, just walk out kind of feeling the sun and the summer. Definitely. I think that's a great endorsement. Well, I wish you best of luck with the uh, release. 